This video will cover slides 16 through 26 in the Chapter 1 lecture notes. The topics will include a discussion on the carbon atom and its isotopes, followed by a discussion on the Bohr model of the carbon atom, followed by an introduction to the quantum mechanical model of the carbon atom. Most of this will be a review from general chemistry with just a focus on the carbon atom. Atoms are characterized as the smallest discrete unit of an element. For carbon, elemental carbon, that atom consists of a nucleus and electrons. The nucleus contains both neutrons and protons as shown down here in the Bohr model of the carbon atom. There are six protons in carbon, and that's what determines that it is carbon, the number of protons. That is given as the atomic number. So if I looked on the periodic table, I'd see a six associated with carbon. That tells me there are six protons. The atomic mass, or molecular weight, of carbon is 12. That is the combination of all the protons and the neutrons in an atom. So if I look at the nucleus, I see there are six protons and six neutrons. Together that equals 12, so that's the mass number for carbon. In a neutral element of carbon, that atom contains six electrons, the same number of electrons as it has protons, so it's neutral. I have six positive charges in the center of the atom, and I have six negative charges in the electron cloud around the carbon atom. Together that gives us a neutral. As we're going to find out later in this chapter, elements and atoms can exist as charged species. We call these species ions. If it's a positively charged species, meaning it lacks one electron, we call it a cation. If it's a negatively charged species, it has an extra an electron, one more than the number of protons, we call that an anion. So if I look at some periodic tables, I notice that my mass number is not 12.000, meaning it's not an integer. It has actually has its 12.011. And why is that? Okay. The reason for that is carbon actually has some naturally occurring isotopes. Isotopes are just elements that have the same number of protons but the different number of neutrons. If I have an atom with six protons, that is elemental carbon, no matter how many neutrons it has. So 12.011 that shows up in many periodic charts is the abundance average value. So if I look at carbon and its abundance levels in nature, at least on Earth, 98.8% .8 of all the carbon on Earth contains six protons and six neutrons. 1.1% of the carbon on Earth contains six protons and seven neutrons, so it has an extra neutron. Approximately 0.1% of all the carbon on Earth has six protons and eight neutrons. If I take the abundance average value for that, so I take carbon 12 times 98%, carbon add to that carbon 13 times 1.1%, add to that carbon 14 at 0.1%, I get 12.011. So that's how we sort of understand what the atomic mass is. So if I went out and got a sample of carbon from any source on Earth, I would get approximately 98% carbon-12, 1.1% carbon-13, and 0.1% carbon-14. When we discuss organic chemistry in organic chemical reactions, we typically do not talk about reactions at the nuclear level. We talk about reactions between electrons, either shared electrons to form sigma bonds or pi bonds. And those electrons are actually a cloud of electrons 
around the positively charged nucleus as represented here in the Bohr model. These electrons are responsible for the chemical bonding and the chemical reactions that occur and are responsible for most of the physical properties related to the different elements. It's not the neutrons and the protons. If I look at the Bohr model for the carbon atom, I notice that there are four electrons in this outermost orbit, and there are two electrons closer to the nucleus. These two close to the nucleus in the quantum mechanical shell n equals one are not typically involved in chemistry. It's the outermost, the ones that are not bound to the nucleus as strongly, that are involved in chemical reactions, and we call those our valence electrons. And carbon happens to have four valence electrons. That Bohr model of the carbon atom has some very good properties to it, but we know it doesn't explain all the chemical properties and chemical reactions that carbon undergoes. So we've modified that model, and we have a new model called the quantum mechanical model, where the electrons are not located in orbits around the central axis, but they're rather in probability-defined orbitals. That means orbitals at where the electrons are most likely, and they're at finite energy levels. So if we look at the quantum mechanical model for carbon, we see that there's a spherical orbital down in near the nucleus of the atom, and that contains two electrons. And then we have a second spherical orbital, the 2s orbital, that contains two electrons. And then we have three sort of dumbbell-shaped orbitals in the two energy level that also contains the last two electrons of carbon. So a six electrons total. These orbitals are defined quantum mechanically as the shell, which is defines the size of the orbital, how far it is away from the nucleus. And we typically have shells one, two, three, and four for carbon. And subshells within those shells, which define the shape of the shell. The S is going to be spherical, the P is going to be dumbbell in shape, and D and F shells, which do not have electrons in them in carbon, that have very unique shapes to them. If I start putting those six electrons into those shells, what we find out is that we have two electrons in each shell, and we fill those shells sequentially based on energy level. So I put two electrons in the 1s shell, I put two electrons in the 2s shell, and I put two electrons in the 2p shell. This concept of probability first came about by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where he mathematically said that you cannot determine exact location of electron in a shell or a subshell. Instead, we mathematically predict the probability of where it can be based on quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics just being a whole bunch of mathematics put together. If we look at the simplest shell, the spherical s orbital, we can look at that and define it as a shell. So here would be a three-dimensional representation of the 1s shell. Here would be a three-dimensional representation of the 1s and the 2s shell. If I looked at this in just a two-dimensional plane, sort of as a dense matrix here, and I calculate the probability of where will that electron be in that 1s shell, the most likely place for that electron to be is smack dab in the center. I can look at it in a different way. If I plot that two-dimensionals, I plot distance away from the nucleus on the x-axis, both moving to the right and moving to the left and I predict the electron density probability as a function of that distance, it also mathematically predicts that that electron will be right smack dab in the middle of the nucleus. Well, we know that is not a physical case, so we have to do some more mathematics. Heisenberg uncertainty principle does a very nice job of starting that mathematics. So let's just look at one section here. Let's just look at the top probability 
of the right half slice through that sphere. Schrodinger expanded on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and he showed that electrons can actually behave as waves, and they have a wave probability function. He mathematically predicted the probability of an electron's position through a series of very complex equations, most of these based on Maxwell's equations for light. If we look at the solutions to those equations and just look at a cross section through a sphere, so going from the nucleus out to the outside of that sphere, I literally get the probability function that the electron should be right in the center of the nucleus. But I need to multiply that times the volume of that sphere to get some statistics. So if I take the probability density based on Schrodinger's equations, and I multiply that times the spherical surface area, taking this function times that function, I get together a new function, which we call the radial distribution function. And what it shows is that the electron is most likely in this darker blue region here about the nucleus. And in fact, when I solve these equations for the 1s shell, I get an answer that is really, really close to the experimentally measured value. So it's a good model based on experimental data. If I do the same calculations for the next shells, I get a nice spherical solution for the 2s orbital. And I get these three degenerate dumbbell-shaped orbitals or balloon-shaped orbitals. And they're degenerate just means they all have the same energy. When I look at that radial distribution function, I notice that the electrons, the probability of them being in a, is going to be in a little bit away from the nucleus. And there'll be a node. There's no probability that it'll be in the nucleus. So if I look at a three-dimensional representation of these three degenerate orbitals, we'll call them p orbitals now, if I look at just the green ones, there's a probability that there's going to be one electron in this green area here. There's a probability that there's going to be an electron in this blue area here. And there's a probability that there's going to be one electron in this z area here. So if I look at that, we're going to actually call these p orbitals a px, a py, and a pz, just based on their orientation in a three-dimensional axis. We have a number of rules that places electrons into these orbitals. If I look at the Bohr model, I literally just fill the lowest energy levels first. So I have two spherical orbitals. I put two electrons down in the one orbital, the one closest to the nucleus, and I put the other four into the second orbital at higher energy here. And if I look at this model, it does a very nice job of predicting that I have four electrons here that want to do chemistry. They want to react with other electrons from other atoms to form molecules. If I look at the quantum mechanical model, I can sort of do the same thing. However, there is another principle that we've talked about in general chemistry, the Pauli exclusion principle that says each orbital in the quantum mechanical model can only hold two electrons each. So when I start putting them into the orbitals, I put the first two electrons into the 1s orbital. I put the second electrons into the 2s orbital. And now I still need to put two electrons in these three degenerate orbitals, but I have three of them now to put in. There's another rule that comes about that's Hund. He said that when there are two or more orbitals of the same energy being degenerate, the electrons will first go into different orbitals rather than pairing up. And so instead of having two orbitals paired up, I put one of my electrons in a px and I put one in a py. 
They could have gone to the PZ too, but they're all equal. Notice here, I still have four valence electrons. I have two in the 2s, and I have two in one of the 2p orbitals. Valence means that I have electrons that are all in the same shell, but they can still be in different subshells. So if I look at carbon, I have two electrons in the 1s shell. I have two electrons in the 2s subshell, one electron in the 2px subshell, and one electron in the 2py subshell. So I have two electrons, two electrons, one electron, electron, for a total of six electrons, four of those electrons being in the outermost shell, represented here by two, and that's the ones that do chemistry. Remember, everything we've talked about so far has been atomic carbon, meaning an isolated atom of carbon that has not formed any bonds. This quantum mechanical model does, still does not do a very good job of predicting the geometries of molecules where carbon has actually formed a bond with another atom. So we have to modify the mathematics again. We modify the quantum mechanical model. One of the most famous chemists of all time modified that atomic quantum mechanical model to account for bonding, and he developed a molecular model, and he called it a hybrid quantum mechanical orbital model where he mathematically changed or combined some of the orbitals. So what he did is he took that atomic quantum mechanical model, again from isolated atomic carbon, and he mixed mathematically the 2s orbital with the 2px, 2py, and 2pc, and came up with four new degenerate 2 sp3 orbitals. So in this case, he took a s orbital, combined it with three p orbitals to form a 2sp3 orbital, a second 2sp3 orbital, a third 2sp3 orbital, and a fourth 2sp3 orbital. Each of these orbitals can hold two electrons, but based on Hund's rule, I'm only going to put one electron in there, solve the mathematics for quantum mechanical probability, and what I come up with now is I still have my 1s orbital, which is down near the nucleus, it's still spherical, but I come up with four new degenerate orbitals that all have the same shape. Each of them is called an sp3 orbital. Each can hold two electrons, and those electrons will come, the two electrons will come when they share electrons with other atoms. And this, if you look at it in three dimensions, looks tetrahedral. And that very closely represents what the organic molecules look like. They have a tetrahedral shape. So we call this the hybridized quantum mechanical orbital model.